And now, the survival show that once survived being gassed by a Weimariner. In this episode, we sit down with author, lawyer, and champion of the Second Amendment, Stephen Halbrook. He's going to share with us a lesson, a history lesson, on gun control from Nazi Germany. Howdy and welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 264. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Mr. Halbrook, Stephen, thank you for being on the rabbit hole today. Uh, Aaron, thank you for having me on your show. Now, you are you are a prolific author, but today in particular, I mean, we wanted to focus on gun control in the Third Reich, disarming the Jews and enemies of the state. Um, you are a lawyer, author, and research fellow with the Independent Institute. Uh, I think some other in- things that the audience might find interesting are that you test against, testified against the confirmation of Eric Holder as Attorney General uh, and filed an amicus, amicus brief. Uh, in the Heller case. So you have uh, a bit of history with this kind of subject. Yeah, it was very because I represented a majority of members of the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. And it was pretty incredible that that many people agreed to have their name associated with that brief. Mm. Well, and I, I guess that's that's good that hopefully we have that that kind of thing has that sort of support. That's right. And the whole issue was the Second Amendment, whether it really exists, whether it protects individual rights, whether the D.C. handgun ban was valid or invalid. And of course, we argued that it was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. And that's what the Supreme Court held in the Heller decision in a 5-4 opinion. Well, thank you for being a defender of our rights, particularly the Second um, you know, I think it was it was funny as I was preparing for today's interview. I found it, it was so easy for me to get off topic and want to to end up focusing on the second. Um, but maybe we can do that at a later date. And I'll do my best to stay on topic today. Let's start here. Why why was this book in particular uh, one that you felt needed to be to be written? Well, um, when I was a young college student, um, I I followed what was happening in Congress on the gun control debate. It was a big deal in those days. We're talking 1968. Hmm. And there were proposals to require registration of all firearms in the United States by the federal government. And that was opposed in Congress by, among other people, Congressman John Dingell, a Democrat from Michigan, who said, well, We've heard this stuff before. Wasn't this part of Nazi Germany's policy toward its own citizens and toward the countries in, uh, that it occupied? And there was a major study done by, of all institutions, the Library of Congress, denying that it ever happened, that the Nazis never required registration of guns. They never uh, used lists of registered gun owners to round up the people to take their guns away so they could do whatever they wanted to do with them. And that sparked my interest. And uh, over the years, particularly starting about 20 years ago, I began uh, doing research in an energetic way in archives in Germany. Um, And uh, I ended up retaining archival experts there who knew a lot more than I did about uh, the records that might be available. And I ended up with this book, Gun Control in the Third Reich, uh, which basically shows how these Gun control laws, particularly registration, um, which was enacted, by the way, by the Weimar Republic, uh, Democratic uh, government at the time, uh, that those records ended up being used by the Nazis when they came to power to disarm all of their political opponents. That was 1933. Uh, And then in 1938, to disarm the German Jews uh, in the events leading up to Kristallnacht or the Night of the Broken Glass. So. Um, it was incredible to me why no historians had ever covered the topic. And um, I, I just got into it and, and uh, decided I'm going to cover it. And, and uh, it was a long time getting all that research together. The documents, of course, were originally in German, and, uh, but, but we have it now. So, yeah. and, and the book, by the way, has been translated into German and into French and, and Portuguese. Oh, wow. That's really neat. 
So, and I think people may stop at the word Jew in the title, uh, but but as you said, the, the history itself, I mean, it also includes the words, you know, enemies of the state. Um, so this went far beyond just a singular group. Um, there were, you know, basically anybody that was labeled an enemy of the state that, as far as how its later use. Right. The enemies of the state were more important uh, for the Nazis to to smash, basically, than the Jews were at first. Uh, the enemies of the state were all the political opponents. That would be the Social Democrats, the liberals, uh, various traditional conservatives, monarchists, uh, uh, people of all political views that were not considered politically reliable to the National Socialists. And, and by the way, Nazism start uh, stands for National socialist german workers party it's a form it was a form of socialism mm -hmm. um and it, so what what happened after the nazis came to power is they had all these lists of registrations uh gun registrations and, and licenses and they went through the list my my book i have translated um copies of some of these um police records where personally reliable that meant whether they were a uh, national socialist and if they were a social democrat uh, or certain other kinds of people, maybe a Jew, then their guns would be confiscated. They were not considered eligible. Uh, and But it, it didn't just take place like that. I mean, it, it took place in terms of massive searches and seizures of houses. Uh, I mean, when the Nazis came to power uh, and pretty quickly, Hermann Goering was appointed the minister of the interior for Prussia. Uh, the police went on a wild spree of breaking into people's houses and seizing guns and, and stealing things. I mean, a lot of these were brown shirt types. Mm. Um, so a lot of this was conducted violently. It wasn't just that they were going down the list of saying, well, your gun license is revoked. There was some pretty aggressive methods going on. And by, shoot, by, by May or so of, of 1933, you remember Hitler comes to power on, on January 30th. By May, the labor unions had all been abolished. All these other political parties uh, were either on the run or abolished. Um, the the tightening up of the regime, the, the dictatorship had proceeded very efficiently. And seizing the people's guns, all, anybody who might oppose them, um, that was an extremely important part of this very quick consolidation of power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was struck by how how swiftly the Nazis moved to take action, seemingly using the registries. Um, and even when they couldn't find guns, they would just beat people up and sometimes even beat them to death. Right. Um, and let's turn the clock back, though, for a minute to the 1920s and put this in context. Mm -hmm. Germany lost the Great War. You had the imposition of the Versailles Treaty, which was... Um, it was a good way to have, make sure there was going to be another war, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, what a terrible war. They, they should have walked away from it and just tried to rebuild. But instead, it was an attempt to hold Germany responsible. Mm -hmm. And so, so in Germany, you, you get hit not only with the reparations, but then along comes the Great Depression. And uh, at the same time, you have the Reds and the Browns fighting in the streets, the communists and the Nazis. Uh, also trying to seize power. You had in 1919 and 1923 attempts by the communists to seize power in Germany following the Bolshevik method. 1923, you also have the Beer Hall Putsch that Hitler uh, led, where he tried to seize power in Munich, and, and it failed miserably. Uh, he was incarcerated for a year for that. But uh, So anyway, the, the people in the, the Reichstag, the parliament, thought, well, why don't we pass some gun laws and do something about all this political violence? And so um, the, the first thing that was done was a 1928 law uh, that actually passed the parliament. And it required um, not registration of existing guns, but it required licenses to, licenses to acquire guns. And so you have the beginning of, the, of a registration system. But then by late 1931, you have a decree uh, being made by the uh, the Reich ch Chancellor uh, and, and approved by basically the executive branch bypassing uh, the Parliament or the Reichstag. Uh, see, Germany had 
an enabling act that allowed in a so-called emergency, the executive could simply impose laws and decrees that would not be voted on by the legislature. Mm -hmm. So they did that. They imposed a registration requirement. And the most interesting part about it was that the minister of the interior, that would be like our Justice Department or our attorney general, said, uh, be careful, don't let these registration records, gun registration records, fall into the wrong hands, like the hands of radical elements. Mm -hmm. Um, And that could could happen, they thought, in local disturbances. So this was December of of 31. Mm -hmm. So what happens in at the end of January of 33, well, the ones they warned you about came to power. The, Hitler came to power as the, the Reich chance, Chancellor, mm. and the worst nightmare came true. I mean, it was a lot worse than the guns, the registration records being seized and local disturbances. Mm-hmm. The, the extremist group was now in power. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed there was a repeated sentiment by Weimar officials saying, hey, like, this is this this is something dangerous like we really need to be careful with this was that repeated in the book was that your emphasis or was that something that was actually like a regular thing where as the Weimar Republic was instituting these laws like those officials did keep standing up and saying hey we again and again we really need to be uh, careful with this was the emphasis yours or was the emphasis theirs well uh the the minister of the interior said it once okay and that was when the program was established and he this went out to all the police stations and and the local jurisdictions don't let these records fall into their own hands i only found one record where he said that okay the, there had been a number of records going back and forth do we really need this and and by the way the same arguments were made in the 20s that you hear now mm-hmm. um you had those saying, well, OK, if we register and license law abiding people, that's going to get rid of the violence. And you had others saying that what you hear today, uh, that this is not going to do anything. Criminals are not going to go by this. You think they're going to register any guns? Mm-hmm. And by the way, how many communists and how many Nazis would have registered guns pursuant, do you, do you think, to the 1931 decree? Mm-hmm. Like maybe, maybe zero or, or maybe a few. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that wasn't going to be what what they would they would do. So. The, the the records were basically used against law-abiding people. And, and it, keep in mind, the European Union right now uh, has has passed a decree requiring a national electronic registration records of all gun and gun owners in, in, in a centralized way where it can be shared throughout the entire European Union. And guess which country was the first one to complete that process of having a central electronic registration of all Germany? Mm. some things you just don't learn yeah yeah and i think there was to to turn back the clock a little bit more i've heard the dismissive argument that gun laws were already strict in germany before the nazis and before the weimar republic um and that this conversation is just a loose association under the the to counter strict gun control is that is that accurate did germany because i mean there seemed to be a lot of shooting clubs for a country that that had uh for the argument that uh, that they always had strict gun laws, right? I mean, um, th- there were the shooting sports were very very um, widespread and popular. You also had a, a lot of hunting, as particularly in southern Germany, mm. which you still have today, by the way. Mm. Um, and but but it was kind of a mismatch. Uh, the laws were not consistent because Germany uh, was divided between you had Prussia and then you had the the Länder or states. Uh, and they had their own laws. There, there was no national law to speak of. Uh, the only ethnic-related law they had was um, Bavaria had a law against gypsies possessing possessing guns. Mm. But in terms of uh, you know national unity, it just wasn't there for purposes of gun control laws. And so, w- once the uh, the Versailles Treaty comes down, some interpreted that to mean. And then others in Germany interpreted that to mean that only um, military guns had to be turned in. So there was, um, uh, you know, notices that went out to the public in 1919 telling the people what you had to do. And there was a lot of conflict there. And you had some pretty draconian um, uh, punishments that were threatened. But when you get to the, the 1928 law, that 
had some good and bad aspects. The good aspects were it, it made the law uniform in Germany. So you had you didn't have a mismatch of different laws every time you cross some boundary between a state or, or when you went into Prussia or whatever. Um, and, it, and it preempted some of the local uh, laws. Uh, the bad part of it, though, was the requirement of getting police approval anytime you acquired any kind of firearm. And it also had language that the Nazis would later seize on, which was uh, that if you were considered an enemy of the state or considered uh, unreliable or untrustworthy, pretty broad concepts. Instead of saying that if you had a record as a violent felon or, or you know a mental commitment or something like that, it was it was so broad that you could use and read into it anything you wanted to read into it. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that that's the good and the bad and the ugly about the the 1928 law, uh, and then it just got worse with the registration decree from 1931. And how many people do you think registered, and what types of people? Well, we don't have data. Uh, bad people didn't register. Good people did. And mm-hmm. one of the, one of those people, a person that I highlighted in the book because it really tells the human story, Alfred Flattop. He was a uh, Olympic champion when the Athens um, 1896 Olympics took place. He represented Germany in gymnastics, and he won uh, first place medals. Uh, he came back to Germany, and um, he he was very much a promoter of, of the sports. Uh, he owned a bicycle shop, and he was he was just a kind of a regular guy, and he happened to be Jewish. Mm. And in 1932, he registered his guns, three handguns. And then when you turn the clock forward, though, in 1938, and the, the reason I know all of this is because of his arrest record in 1938. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's commonly thought uh, incorrectly that the Night of the Broken Glass only came about because there was a Polish teenager who was Jewish upset about German-Polish refugee policy. He went into the Paris embassy and shot a German diplomat. And so the, 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 the Nazi account of all this was, oh, Jews worldwide are a danger to public safety and they all have to be disarmed. Well, it didn't start there. It started months before that and, and, and weeks before that, uh, just using the Alfred Flatov arrest record. Mm-hmm. Here you have in October of 1938, uh, several weeks before Kristall knocked, uh, Alfred Flatov being arrested. And this is the way I found out about him, by the way. Um, this, I, I found out from this arrest report of Alfred Flatov in nineteen in, in October of nineteen thirty eight mm. that he was being arrested for gun possession. And when I I googled his name and place of birth and and birth date, I found out he was this famous Olympic champion very well known in Germany and in, in as, as a sports figure. But it, the key to all of this comes together with the, with this four page report. Um, he's arrested in October of 38. What was his crime? It said being a Jew with a gun. Well, guess what? That was not a crime yet. But because of the fact that the Nazis were taking all of these non-legal actions against Jews, they were starting to arrest them already at that point, well before the night of the broken glass. Hmm. It didn't all start there. This was pre-planned. And and what's, it has a blank in the full arrest report for what statute did he violate, and that's, that's blank because there wasn't any. Uh, and then it goes on to say, Jews are a danger to public safety, uh, a danger to the German people. Uh, he It says that he had three handguns and, and some other hand weapons that he turned in. And he said that they were registered in 1932 and the uh, registration was still at that police station, which it cited. So here you have the whole story. He registered his guns and now he's being arrested for his guns. They were legal because he's Jewish. And, and here there was a mystery to this arrest report, the, the address. That was not his address because it has what is the address of the the crime scene? Mm. And once we just did a lot of research, because that address didn't exist anymore, that turned out to be the address of the police station. Mm. The crime scene was the police station. And then when I found other arrest reports, like five minutes after 
this individual, another guy who was Jewish, turning in his guns, it all became clear. Uh, Jews had been ordered to turn in their guns in, in, in Berlin. And that's what they were doing. They were standing in line at the police station, turning them in. And with both, there's at least two of these arrest reports where it says they reg- it tell, told where they registered their guns and what year. And so there's another arrest report we found, though, where um, there was a, a so-called Aryan tried to help his Jewish friend hide his guns. Mm. He didn't turn them in. And so he get, they both get arrested. And so you have this going on weeks before Kristallnacht. Mm. And and finally, when you have the incident in the Paris embassy, uh, and then you have Hitler and Goebbels agreeing that we're going to attack the Jewish people and make them pay. And and, and so that that's in November, November 9, 10, 11, that period. You have the attacks on, um, uh, you know, burning Jewish synagogues, uh, breaking the glass. That's where that term came from, of, of stores of Jewish merchants. Uh, you have houses being ransacked and all, by the way, in the with the excuse and in the name of uh, we have to seize the weapons because these Jews are a danger to the German people. Mm. And, and so um, they did a lot of I mean, it was all to intimidate them. Uh, they had no cause to believe they all had weapons. That was so ridiculous. Uh, but a number did. And, and a number turned them in voluntarily. At the same time, you have a decree by Himmler threatening uh, 20 years in a concentration camp for any Jew that possessed a weapon. And you had the rounding up and arrest of 20 to 30,000 Jewish men, supposedly because they had weapons, which was a lie. Uh, it was to get ransom from them, to get out of the concentration camps. Mm. Well, I mean, what a story. Yeah. Yeah. That's... And it all happened. It, it's, it's for real. So let's don't deny things that happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's take a quick break for this vital message. Listener, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH? You should see what we do for the Roving Horde Armada members. Check it out today by visiting ITRH.net. Members receive access to the private ITRH Armada Slack group where they get to connect, ask questions, get the news, escape the nonsense in their social media feeds, and shenanigans. Twice a month, members get together on a private virtual roundtable. We discuss guns, meat, news that matters, and other things you just can't talk about with anybody else. Access to members-only content and every episode ever produced. And that's just to name a few things you get with your membership when you sign up through iturh.net. In the rabbit hole is mostly kept on the air and supported by members just like you. Go to iturh.net to find out more and become part of the Roving Horde Armada. Now... Back to today's guest. You know, there was so much that's terrifying about this, but, you know, I think one thing that is one of the takeaways I got from this is how easy it is for laws to be made in general, but, you know, particularly as as the, the locust of this conversation, uh, gun laws and the presumption being it's for the greater good. And then just as easily, uh, very shortly, those laws made for the greater good are turned against the people. You know, history, Aaron, doesn't always repeat it itself, but it does sometimes. Mm-hmm. And you got to be careful what you wish for. What can go wrong will go wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, it, OK, this is not happening here today in the U.S. But by the way, we have a Second Amendment. It couldn't happen here because we don't have gun registration and we don't have the kind of um, rule by executive decree that they had in, in Germany at that time. Uh, All the things that came together to make bad things happen there. We have good institutions, as imperfect as they are. We do have the right to jury trial where the people participate. We have um, elections. You know, (laughs) people Mm -hmm. can vote for more than one person. Mm -hmm. And and we have the right to keep and bear arms. I mean, these rights didn't exist there uh, in in Germany at that time. Particularly, there was no Second Amendment right. Mm -hmm. As long as we protect them. Uh, Yeah. So, you know, you, you brought up an interesting point a little while ago that really, and I guess this, this kind of plays into history doesn't always repeat itself, but, but it often it does, um, that the argument against uh, or for these gun laws and against the gun laws are really much the same. And I noticed that in reading the book, they're really almost identical to what we hear today. Right. Um, 
I, I mean, you can draw parallels. You could put the regulations side by side, and, and there's a lot of things there that are uh, very similar. Uh, but what we don't have is a universal registration system by the federal government. In fact, that's illegal under federal law. Mm-hmm. And when you go to uh, the debates in Congress where these laws making it illegal were passed, that was 1986 Firearms Owners Protection Act, uh, and then it's even in the Brady Act from 1993, it, it explicitly prohibits the federal government from re- registering firearms that are not uh, that that would be. Those required to be registered would be like machine guns, other National Firearms Act weapons. Mm-hmm. But basically, registration is illegal by the federal government based on these experiences. Don't forget, we had newspapers during the 30s and 40s. Americans were reading about this stuff going on in, in Germany at the time. And then when other countries got occupied uh, in France or um, – I'll show my book. There's a sequel to the uh, Gun Control in the Third Reich. It's Gun Control in Nazi Occupied France. Mm-hmm. People were reading, and, and, and I repeat these newspaper articles in this book, uh, the names of people who were shot for gun ownership in, in France because they didn't turn their guns in. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, this this kind of stuff happens. Uh, they they and, and by the way, France went the same way as Germany in 1935. They decreed gun registration. Hey, what could go wrong with that? Yeah. And, and then in 1940, the Germans come in. The French police worked for the Germans. They had the registration records. And, and it's 20. It, it's not just 20 years in a concentration camp uh, if you have a gun. It's we're going to execute you if you don't turn in your guns in 24 hours. Mm-hmm. So so Americans have learned the lessons. Now, there are some a handful of states in in the U.S. where the lesson uh, it has not been learned. And that would be, uh, you, you name them, New York, New Jersey, California. Yeah. Um, I mean, anything they can do to make life uh, hard for gun owners, they do. And, and and they're going in the direction of registration. They have these bans on what they call assault weapons, which is just a propaganda term. It has no meaning, means anything they want it to mean. Yeah. Um, and, and there are parallels there, too, because in the European countries, um, back in the 20s and 30s, they were banning what would be called today military military style rifles. Uh, the the bans at that time didn't include silly things like protruding pistol grips, like now mm-hmm. assault weapons, uh, but included military calibers. So in, in France or in Germany, there were restrictions on buying a gun or ha- having a gun that fired a military caliber uh, cartridge. And also there were, um, you could call them puny gun requirements where you, you couldn't have a pistol of very high caliber. And that's why you have a lot of 20, 25 caliber revolvers being manufactured in Europe in the 20s because of these laws. Oh, OK. All right. That that actually makes something unrelated make more sense now. You know, the assault weapon thing is, is really, to me, just the logic there just just hurts my brain is it's they want to use that term and refer to those weapons as military style weapons yet they're actually going completely against the military our own military's definition of what an assault weapon actually is um and it, it's a a game of unfortunate uh a, a spin and pr uh in a, in a very gross way so yeah uh, I mean, let's be clear an assault weapon uh, or an assault rifle, the military definition is selective fire intermediate cartridge. Uh, it can fire full auto, it can fire semi-auto, or or maybe in, in a burst, a three-round burst or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the, the chief military characteristic that, ma- that distinguishes it. Mm-hmm. And to say that rifles that require a separate pull of the trigger for each shot is is an assault weapon is nothing but a just a, a massive propaganda stroke that that's worked pretty well uh, in certain states. Mm-hmm. But, uh, one other thing I want to address while we're on that topic is people say, well, none of this would have made any difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Jews couldn't have overturned the Nazi dictatorship. Well, of course not. But all this started in 33, disarming the political opponents. The, this is forcing in the line of everything in society under the, the Nazi uh, hierarchy and command. Uh, that took a lot of time. Mm-hmm. And, and, and by contrast, though, you can find instances where um, you have heroic resistance of, of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my favorite example, of course, is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising from 1943, where 
you had so many people, so many Jews being deported to death camps. And there were some uh, young Jewish activists who said, you know, we're going to put it, we're, we're, we, this is unacceptable. They had only about a dozen handguns to start with. They were able to use those handguns to uh, maybe shoot a few German soldiers, get some rifles. And, and eventually you have a resistance movement, uh, resistance activities that went on for weeks and stopped the deportations for a while. Some of them escaped and they lived to tell the tale. Mm -hmm. The Nazi propaganda minister said, this shows what Jews can do when they have guns in their hands. Mm. So, so don't tell me that there's no place for civilian resistance to dictatorship. Mm -hmm. I've heard an even dumber statement from a historian that was, oh, they would have just made it worse. And my response was, what was worse than liquidation? And then the other part of that is when they, oh, well, you know, civilians couldn't have risen up against uh, an, an army like that. And I'm like, really? I, I think the Afghans have, and uh, the Taliban has kind of shown us that's, that's not exactly accurate. Uh, they gave us, they, they gave us quite a handful for, for quite a long time, uh, seemingly sheep herders or, or goat herders. So it's, it, yeah, it's inaccurate. Uh, you can have individual acts where just one life is saved. Mm -hmm. And there were instances like that. There was a, a, a woman and this was reported in the press. I mean, we don't know how many times this happened, but, uh, a, in, in Holland and a Dutch policeman came to see some Jews and she shot the policeman. Mm -hmm. and um, just individual instances like that. Uh, people helping refugees get out of Nazi Germany or getting out of occupied France. The, the people helping them do that had to have guns. And you had, uh, how could you have had a resistance in an occupied countries like France or Poland or elsewhere without the people doing the sabotage and having the, the secret meetings and providing intelligence for the allies? They had to have guns. Um, and, and finally, when you had the, the invasion, D-Day, Normandy, and all that, in, in France, you had the resistance in the mountains by the French. So, um, and, and if you want to say that, well, only armies protect countries, um, all of these occupied countries, their armies failed to protect the, the, those nations, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about Czechoslovakia or Poland or, um, you know, France, uh, Norway. The armies failed. And all you had left was civilian resistance. And so, yeah, that wasn't enough to overcome uh, the, the German armies, but it was enough to, to have a spark of resistance. Mm -hmm. You made a, uh, a statement early on in the book, for whatever reasons, historians have paid no attention to Nazi laws and policies restricting firearms ownership as essential elements in creating tyranny. Uh, you've had a few years to reflect on this. Can you, would you care to speculate at all why? It is so prevalent that historians tend to ignore uh, that part of history and and this piece of of that that puzzle in in what happened with the Nazis. Yeah, I mean, puzzle indeed. I, I've never figured that out. You've got maybe way too many books about Nazi Germany and and World War II. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many more books on the Gestapo do you, do you want? I like right. because some some of them are really great contributions to the literature, but a lot of them are just. Me too, saying the same stuff over and over. Mm -hmm. and, and on every subject, like the Nazi war on cancer, um, you know, the, uh, the, the Nazi use of the IBM uh, punch card technology. Uh, I mean, how specialized can you get? And yet no historian ever did something so essential, so necessary to creating this dictatorship, allowing it to consolidate its power, and to in, uh, successfully invade other countries and to repress resistance. <laughs> Why didn't anybody say anything about that? And, 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 mm -hmm. and there's a lot of really good books on Kristallnacht, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Night of the Broken Glass. But there's hardly any mention whatever, if, and in many of the books, no mention whatever, of the disarming. Mm -hmm. You have to go to diaries of, of people and remembrances of, for example, Jews who lived in those days, because then they talked about it uh, in the diaries. Uh, they say, yeah, we got the announcement. We had to turn the guns in and father was very afraid and mother threw the guns into the river or the police came out and searched. And he said, yeah, I've got some uh, uh, wartime bayonet up in the in the uh, the attic because I was an officer in World War One. And you know, you got to go to these original documents to find anything about it. Mm 
Um, and you got to go to the newspapers like you have the announcement of um, the P Berlin police chief Heldorf saying that that uh, all Jews had been ordered to turn in their guns and that uh, they had already confiscated. They gave several thousand a, a number that they said they had confiscated. And and any who don't turn in their guns right away are really going to be severely punished. And so you can find this stuff in the newspapers mm -hmm. and you can find uh, internal reports of it uh, in the archives, the German archives. But um, yeah, Aaron, I, I've never figured out why this topic was never covered. I mean, yeah, it, it's just a blank. Do you, do you think it's, I mean, do you think it's malicious or do you think maybe it's just they don't want to wade into what might be a hot political topic and take away from whatever work they're doing or they just, they don't want to be associated with it at all or, I mean, it just, or just no clue at all? Well, I think, Maybe there's so much Me Too stuff going on when you have the parameters of, of what you're looking for already set but by mm -hmm. existing histories. Might look, but you're kind of thinking that same framework, uh, the same paradigm. Mm -hmm. and, and so I don't think there's anything malicious about that at all. But but I do think that there certainly are, are uh, professional historians who would, would not like this topic and, and don't like this information coming out. And when I first started publishing some of this research before I did the books, uh, I, I did several law review articles and uh, th there was uh, attacks upon my my scholarship uh, by uh, members of the legal community who don't like this history coming out. Uh, what, what's being argued when it's pointed out, well, they they used uh, the registration records to disarm the Jews. And, and that by disarming them, that made them powerless. Uh, so you have the counter argument by those who would like to, who don't like gun ownership in the U.S., where they say members of the legal profession or historians have, have argued, well, only the police and the military should have guns. And so the problem was in Nazi Germany that the it was discriminatory to just pick on the Jews. Uh, and, 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 and they also argue, by the way, well, they had lenient gun laws cause it was just the Jews they were disarming. Mm. And it's like, uh, yeah, just the Jews. And <laughs> that's not good enough. Um, but so imagine a society where nobody had no civilian had guns and only the, the Nazi dictatorship had all the guns. Is, is that what they're, you're asking for or saying that would be ideal? I mean, it, it, uh, it, it gets pretty absurd. Yeah. The, the links to which people will go uh and without even maybe realizing just how disgusting their statement is merely to defend their their uh their strange obsession with an inanimate object um and and whether or not it's imbibed with evil or not is just uh, amazing oh god um it, it just makes me cringe uh a, a very random question do you think to, to give it a little more human uh, aspect, do you think Bella Fromm uh, later felt guilty for not having taken her pistol to that social event and having <laughs> the opportunity to shoot Hitler before uh, things really got crazy? Right. Um, Aaron, you're referring to an incident. And Bella, Bella Fromm, by the way, was a very um, well-known socialite in Berlin. Mm -hmm. She happened to be Jewish. And uh, she was invited to a reception and Hitler was there after he came to power and she reflected in this in her memoirs that she wrote after she uh she escaped by the way after Kristall knocked and came was lucky to get to america and uh she thought you know i had this i think she said it was a 25 pistol i'm, I'm not sure now mm -hmm. uh, but i, I could have shot this guy and uh after everything that happened she certainly would have regretted it mm -hmm. but don't don't forget also that Early on, when the Nazis came to power, a lot of people thought, well, this is just one more government coming to power. It's not going to last very long, because if you go through the 20s, you had one government failing after another, and you keep having to have new elections, and mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of different political parties, not just two or three, and coalition governments, they come and go. And so, you know, early on, people didn't think so much that, ah. Eh, you know, he. How long is he going to last? Just the last government before him had only lasted a few months, mm -hmm. and so, um, yeah, she um, she could have done it, but it, but at that time, nobody anticipated what what would happen. Right, right, yeah. 
What uh, tell us a little bit about your new book? Because and I think this is an important piece because it also uh, it also shows definitely or it extends uh, what what this book does as far as showing a a real pattern of disarming uh, a people in order to subjugate them. Well, um, uh, my original intent was just to do one big book about Nazi gun control. Mm-hmm. And I quickly realized that, well, there's a complete story about what happened in, in Germany itself that's got to be a book. And also, you can't just go and write a book about all the occupied countries. It, it had to be, um, I had to pick one country and I had to be able to read the language, which is French. I don't read Polish. I don't read all these other languages. So I decided, okay, France is a good example. Mm. Uh, and so it's the same old, same old, though. In 1934, there were some riots and the police actually killed a number of civilians. One policeman was killed, but that showed the need for gun control and and uh, making it difficult for people to, to have demonstrations, public assemblies. And so 1935, a year later, you have a decree. France had ruled by decree also. This did not go through the parliament. Hmm. Um, Pierre Laval was the prime minister, and he decreed gun registration. And um, also he decreed the increase in the size of the mobile guard. This was a type of police force. And and thirdly, decreed uh, making it where you had to go through all kinds of loopholes to get permission to have a public demonstration. Um, how many people do you think register their guns? I, I don't know. Uh, you didn't have to register hunting guns, uh, but you were supposed to register pistols and certain kinds of rifles and whatnot. Uh, it, it's hard to say. Uh, one of the... Um, jurisdictions I, I looked at was the Ardeen and uh, not many people were registering guns. Mm. Uh, so some did and some did not. There's no data on how many. Um, but then you go to 1940 and France quickly collapses in the, the Blitzkrieg by the German army. Um, the, the agreement, the armistice provided that the French government and the French police in particular would follow the commands of the Wehrmacht, the German army. Now, and I've got photographs of this. When when they went into every place conquered, that you have to turn in your guns within 24 hours or you're subject to being shot. Mm-hmm. That, that's what the, the, the Germans were putting up. And so now you have the French police working for them. They've got the records of registration. And, and then you've got this threat of, we're going to kill you uh, if you don't, don't turn them in. So certainly there were a number turned in. Um, but the French were stubborn people. And, and so what happens next is you have, um, we went through a lot of newspapers in France from the forties, from the occupation period, they would publish the names of people who were executed for, um, violations of German uh, policies. Like, um, somebody would be shot for sabotage or for, uh, uh, you know, maybe listening to the BBC or something, but also Mm -hmm. there were a number of gun owners whose names were published. They were, they were shot for gun ownership, for not turning in their guns. And you had, coming back to power, none other than Pierre Laval, the guy who had decreed registration. And mm-hmm. so he was, he was the real power behind the Vichy government that, that was the puppet of Nazi Germany. And uh, he became the biggest collaborator of, of Nazi Germany. I've got photographs of, in the book of him meeting with oh, the head of the SS in France and, and with Hitler and others. and. Um, and he helped Germany uh, go after the labor force in France, you know, to um, basically conscript young men to make them go to Germany to work. Well, a lot of these men, instead of doing that, went to the mountains. Uh, they never had enough arms, but they did form a partisan movement. Mm. And so you have um, uh, a lot of people disobeying the uh, the command about turning their guns. Um, after the war, there was an estimate that only about, I think it was about a third of the hunting guns had been turned in. Hmm. Uh, people would, would hide the guns. I actually did a questionnaire. I sent it to members who had been in the French resistance. Uh, for, fortunately, I did this 20 years ago when they were still alive. Hmm. And I asked them about your family and your, your own personal experiences. What, what did y'all do? And uh, did you turn your guns in? And and tell me something about your um, resistance activities. And they, I, I got a number of really interesting responses, and I've got them in the book. And they said, well, sometimes we would turn in uh, crummy guns, and we would keep the good ones. We would bury them in mm-hmm. 
maybe a farm outhouse or, or in the ground or something. And um, then they would talk about some of their experiences and, um, you know, fighting Germans or, or rescuing people and being armed while they did that. And uh, so it was quite a, an experience. Um, you know, that, that, that's France's greatest generation, uh, the, uh, those who fought in the resistance. I mean, they were not considered to have any rights under international law. So if the Germans captured you and you were a French a resistance member, even though you might have a, an armband, uh, you would be shot on the spot. There were no POW mm. uh, resistance members. Um, it was either you either fight and if you're captured, you die. So that gave them incentive to keep fighting, by the way, yeah. to the bitter end. Yeah, that's that's quite a commitment on their part. So listeners are hearing this and they're thinking to themselves, this fellow Habrook is my kind of guy. What is the best way for them to see the rest of your catalog and stay on top of the latest? And when this book comes out and all that fun stuff, where should they go? Well, my website is the place. It's stephenhallbrook.com, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-H-A-L-B-R-O-O-K.com. And you'll see the, the books, um, the, the two books now on um, gun control in Nazi Germany, and a couple of books on the experiences of Switzerland during the war, um, books on the Second Amendment and articles on a lot of these subjects as well. So I invite you to look at the website and also um, uh, two of the books are more actually more than two of the books are available from the Independent Institute in Oakland, California. Mm. You could look at their website, independent.org. And then, of course, there's Amazon. You can just Google my name and the names of these books and you can find them about anywhere nowadays. Awesome. What was the, the website address one more time? StephenHallbrook.com. S-T-E-P-H-E-N-H-A-L-B-R-O-O-K.com. Fantastic. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on today. And thank you so much for being such an advocate of the Second Amendment. Well, thank you for having me, Aaron. You, you've got a very interesting operation there. And I, I looked at your website some, and so I'll keep up the good work. I mean, in the rabbit hole is fantastic. Thank you. Show notes, links to Stephen, and other resources can be found by going to intherabbithole.com slash E264. Get more survival goodness and help support the show. Visit itrh.net to become part of the Roving Horde Armada. It's members just like you who really do help keep the lights on. Again, visit itrh.net. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to do all the YouTube stuff. Like this video, subscribe, and slap that bell around because bananas are yellow. With that, we wrap up episode number 264 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound.